Praise the Lord, you reach past the Priscilla Halling. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, thank you for being our habitation, our righteousness, our sanctification, our glorification, our wisdom, our strength, our knowledge and understanding. Thank you for being compassionate, everlasting, eternal, immortal, invisible, sovereign, majestic, holy, and righteous. Thank you for the message you're about to bring to me to continue to equip, to continue to make known how to allow you to uphold all things by the power of your word and keep everything that's been committed to you unto your hands. Let your face shine upon your people and give them the validation of your purpose for their life. Let your knowledge resonate and give them the demonstration of your wisdom above all. Let your shield be a covering, a greater habitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We, we, we're so blessed to be able to be sustained in Christ in like kind. I'm going to be teaching a lesson tonight about being sustained, sustainable in Christ. kindness. And so I'm going to be bringing about what God said about being sustainable. Yeah. so that we might know all that God is saying what's bringing completion. I use an, a phrase, sick, not implying a sick as far as a physical sickness, but sick as far as a short term for sustainable in Christ kindness. S for sustainable, I for N, C for Christ, and K for kindness. Not sick for sickness. Sick meaning sustainable in Christ kindness. And the reason I did that so that you could remember um, is the same way when we do SPA, S-P-A, Socrates, Plato's, and Aristotle, they are memory words that will, that will trigger memory when you hear them so that you could always understand the order in which something is being established for learning. I can't think of the proper name that you would call it at this point, but um, nevertheless, that's why I chose uh, that particular passage. Um, sustainable in Christ's kindness. And there are many verses in the Bible that emphasizes the importance of kindness. That's why I called it 
sustainable in Christ's kind. Because we have so many trials and tribulations and provocations and irritation and strife and contention that tries to take the people of God out of God's kindness. And we have many scripture that tells us the importance of kindness that lets us know that anything that is important to God, there is an influence, spiritual, ungodly spiritual, and fleshly that tries to draw you out of the perfect will, what is pleasing and acceptable unto God. Micah 6, 8 says, he have shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doeth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. This verse highlights mercy or kindness as something the Lord requires alongside justice and humility. It is God's desire that we understand what the importance of kindness is all about. Ephesians 4, 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Here, kindness is linked to forgiveness, showing the Lord's desire for his people to reflect his love and grace. Proverbs 19, 17. He have pity upon the poor, leneth unto the Lord, and that which he have given will he pay again. There are times when you might have kindness shown towards someone who may have been less fortunate. They may have fell on hard times. Uh, maybe the government shut down and they didn't have. Maybe their job was downsized and they were no longer available um, to be able to receive any income. Maybe um, some changes was done in administration or staff and they could no longer receive whatever funds they were made uh, to receive before. We don't know, but God says, if you are lending, you're giving, God said he will pay you again. He'll pay him again. This suggests that the acts of kindness with the less fortunate are seen by God as acts of righteousness. Whatever we do, we don't do to tell others about what we do. We do it in confidentiality. We do it in a way that we understand that God sees. So we don't need anybody trying to make us talk about what we do. Make us show what we're doing. It has nothing to do with what people see someone doing. It's not for them to know. It's not for others to see. The Bible says what you do in secret, he'll reward openly. Colossians 3.12 says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Here God is telling you what is necessary to put on. He didn't tell you to put on a certain garment. He said, put on holy, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Here you're being encouraged to embody kindness as a reflection of your holy calling. I was watching something on social media the other day and it was a church service and this particular church had a visiting pastor and apparently he was going longer than what they had allocated for the time within their service parameters and so the pastor said um I, I don't I don't know all the detail because when it showed, it didn't go from the beginning to the end. It just showed a clip. But he said something to the fact that this is my house. And I asked you to stop service. And the visiting pastor had such a vulgar mouth, he began to use profanity. 
And he was saying that there's so many souls here and that he's doing the Lord's work. Well, as the pastor of the church kept saying things to him, the visiting pastor was so um, ungodly, unkind. Uh, the, the pastor was speaking um, very nicely to him in a kind manner, letting him know, you know, he need to move the service on for whatever reason. And the visiting pastor was very rebellious, uh, very vulgar in his language. There's a way that we could communicate with one another, even when we do not agree in kindness. Because the Bible says we ought to, and Colossians 3.12, we ought to put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. And if we're going to be followers of Christ, as we say we are, if we're going to be holy in our calling, holy and being a believer, holy and being a follower, we're going to have to know what is important that God tells us to put on. The same way he says, put on the arm of God. Here he's saying, put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. We are to show kindness. That's a virtue. That's highly valued by God. And all the attributes, communable attributes that are highly valued by God, the adversary and flesh comes up against it. We ought to be followers living our daily life in kindness. Kindness is not a weakness. Kindness is a strength. It takes more strength to be kind to someone who is dis. Corrupting a place of unity, using vulgar language. Mind this, mind you, this is a clergy, a visiting pastor, cursing vulgarity at another pastor while he's in a church service ministering before people talking about the Lord and how he is in the righteousness of God to be able to save souls. You saw the disunity in the spirit between what he spoke. The, the, the words that he used, they were not godly words. The Bible says we should not have any corrupt communication to proceed out of our mouth. He talks about that type of language. We should not. He said, how can you be cursing and praising me out of the same mouth? No one can bridle the tongue, but the Holy Spirit that lets you know he definitely was not in the spirit of Christ. He lacked kindness. He lacked self-control. He lacked wisdom. He lacked holiness. And godliness, no matter what outward acts he was trying to portray as laying on hands or praying for people or ministering to them as they come to the altar and he had his staff to come to the altar. It was the character in which he projected at the pastor that was set in that place. There's a time and place to handle your disagreements. And so when I saw that, I was brought to remembrance how God can sustain all in Christ through his kindness. Sometimes we can be provoked. And that pastor responded back to him in a very Christ-like way. He didn't yell and scream and use profanity but he spoke in authority. 
He said, here's your belonging. Please be careful. Don't fall or stumble as you leave out. He said, I, 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 this is my house and, and I'm asking you to please end this service. But the visiting pastor was very uh, ungodly and unprofessional. Um, and his mouth was very foul and vile. And um, he certainly did not have self-control, even if he was uh, claiming that he was more concerned about souls. If you're concerned about souls, you're also going to be abiding in the spirit of Christ so that when you speak, you're not conducting yourself as worldliness because we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And he spoke of the world using such language that should not be named among believers. Some things should never come out of our mouth. Some conduct should never be done. And, and we have to use that as a way to examine ourselves. And so this passage lets us know that God is very, very um, concerned about how we treat one another and making sure that we understand um, the... Um, why God is telling us to put on. You see, when Paul wrote this, he was instructing believers in Colossae to live out their faith by embodying Christ-like virtues. And the reason I'm focusing on Christ-like virtues is because that gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves. Either we're going to be in the faith, Christ-like, or we're going to be in another spirit. The Holy Spirit does not use vulgar language. The Holy Spirit will never act unbecomingly. The Holy Spirit will exemplify, personify the fruit of the spirit. And when you have been defiled and you're not feeding the spirit with the things of God, his word, meditation, fasting, and brain, the flesh will excel and an ungodly spirit will excel. That's why you can be around people that will curse. And then be shocked what's coming out their mouth. Because it accidentally came out. They lack self-control. They shouldn't even be allowing it to come out. Those are signs, those are warning actions to let you know. You need to fast and pray and get rid of that cursing spirit. Get rid of that attitude. Get rid of that worldliness. Get rid of that. That is not virtue. And if we're going to live our faith, we live our faith by embodying Christ-like virtues. He did not exemplify Christ-like virtues. Put on therefore. This imagery suggests clothing oneself with these virtues. Just as clothing is visible, these qualities should be evident in a believer's life. It implies an intentional and active choice to adopt these attitudes. Now, that person had on clergy attire. And I don't know the sermon. It didn't show the sermon. 
and I don't know how many people was at the altar, didn't show all the altar and all the altar workers, but apparently he was still ministering at the altar. And if you're ministering at the altar and you're ministering before God, you should be ministering in the spirit of God. And so the spirit of God is not going to use vulgarity. The spirit of God is not going to conduct itself unbecomingly. And so his actions were not in alignment with Christ-like virtues. So he had a form of godliness that appeared on the outer, but the inner showed the lack of connection, the lack of unity, the lack of submission to the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important that while we want to have proper clothing attire on, what sets us apart is not really our clothing attire. Because many can put on clergy clothes. What sets us aside is our Christ-like virtues through the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Now, we should look different in our clothing when we have Christ-like virtues. Uh, you know, as women and men, our, our, our attire should be appropriate. Because we're in the world and not of the world, so we should not be reflecting worldliness. But we ought to be in agreement, not just with our outer representation, but our inner manifestation. Intentional and active choice to adopt these attitudes. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, Paul reminds the Colossians of their identity. They are chosen by God. They are set apart, they are holy, and deeply loved. This foundational truth is the basis for their new way of living. We have to stop thinking that people can determine anything that Christ is doing. That is a rebellious spirit. That is a spirit that lacks knowledge and wisdom about the things of God. If we're in the world, God can shield, close off a lot of things from the outer of the world element. It's not about where you're at with your environment. Your environment should never make you who you are. You should be who you are because of what God has placed within these earthly vessels which means you should have greater strength that the environment doesn't change who you are. That's why you have to separate yourself. Now you can separate yourself while you're still in the environment. You separate yourself by your mind. What you allow to control your mind. You separate yourself by your actions, what you allow your actions to reflect. You separate yourself. from your influences. And we must remember, many of God's people were in captivity, but they never changed their dedication, their faithfulness, their prayer life, nor their obedience unto a holy and righteous God. The environment doesn't make you who you are. You should have within you what you are in any environment. Some environments you can't stay in because the spirit will not be in agreement. So 
That's why you can't allow everything to just enter into your spirit. Vulgarity. You can't look at everything. Ungodliness and the movements and the visualization. We must have Christ-like virtues. We must be sustainable in Christ's kindness through his Holy Spirit. So when I use the acronym, and that's all that is, is just an acronym of sick. I'm not talking about a sickness. It's just a remembrance, a buzzword that will allow you to remember that when you hear it, it's sustainable in Christ's kindness and some people are just not abiding in Christ kindness they're not abiding in godly wisdom they're not making good judgment they're not using wisdom for their decision. Sustainable in Christ's kindness, sick. Not a sickness, sick, but sustainable in Christ's kindness through his Holy Spirit. As the elect of God, holy and love, Paul reminds the Colossians of their identity. They are chosen by God, set apart, holy, and deeply loved. This foundational truth is the basis for their new way of living. God will never set up anything based on a particular person like we do with boys and girls. God is not doing that division. Man and women, God is not doing that type of division. God is dividing by the virtues that we hold as Christians. He establishes based on his will for particular areas that he's manifesting himself to accomplish certain things. So when God said that we are to put on Christ-like virtues, that we are to be set apart, the foundation of truth is the basis for our way of living, bowels of mercy. That's our emotions. That's the seat of our emotions. Compassion. It calls for a deep, heartfelt mercy and empathy towards others. I'm here. This has nothing to do with where I'm at. I'm not going to change no matter where I'm at. Where I'm at will never make me who I am. That means the world is making you. You should be who you are because God is transforming and renewing your life internally. So you don't accept everything where you're at. When they went in captivity, they did not dishonor God. No matter what the law of the land said not to do, if it was an enmity against God, they would not honor it. That's why we're in the world, but not of the world. That's why we abide in Christ. And we don't abide in the flesh. And we don't abide in worldly standards. A preposition in is used to show direction. 
a place, a location, a relationship. We're in this world that God created the world, but we're not of it, which means the influences of this world should not change who we are in a relationship with. So our environment should not change who we're in a relationship with. God can cover. He can put a shield. He can put a door right where you're in that place at. You don't have to leave. He just put a door around you where certain things can't come nigh you. It cannot change you. It cannot defile you. It gives you the inner strength to endure long suffering. It gives you the inner strength to still have Christ-like virtues, kindness, but in truth, the spirit of truth in power to come back unrighteousness to come back ungodliness kindness a considerate attitude gentle that's the fruit of the spirit reflecting God's own kindness towards humanity humbleness of mind true humility involves valuing others above oneself and recognizing one's dependence on God We don't have time to get into who's higher than who, who's better than who, who has more than who. We're in the world, but we're not of the world, so we don't evaluate one another by worldly standards. We evaluate it by Christ-like virtues. It's communable attributes that determine our alignment with the yoking of our association, our fellowship, our relationship, because we're in him, in Christ. And so there's self-control, there's goodness, there's gentleness, there's love, there's joy, there's peace, there's long-suffering. Those are the fruit of the spirit, communable attributes that establishes our character, that establishes our identity, that sets us apart from the world. That's why we are to put on. See, some see, when God says put on, it, it's telling you, just like clothing attire is visible, you have to have some Christ-like virtues that are visible. You can perpetrate in front of many people. But the reality of what you are is going to come out during trials and tribulations. The reality of what you are will come out in disagreements, strife and contention. The reality of what you are will often flow when you lack self-control. And God is establishing and doing all of this. I'm not trying to be liked by people. I'm not trying to be picked and selected by people. I'm not passing out a resume that God has called me for people to tell me who I am, what I am, what I can't do or can do. That's reserved for God and God alone. He writes my resume. He signs off on it and approves my calling. I'm not concerned about humanity. They can't make this final determination. And anyone who's wise in Christ with the virtues of Christ would not even be engaging in this folly of abyss with no resolution. 
constantly changing, wavering between opinions, unstable in all its ways that God is not even engaging in. Giving advice to put on everything but what God said to put on. He said, put on the bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. He didn't tell you to put on humanity's choices of their personal agenda. We don't identify ourselves that way. We're known by the fruit that we bear. We're known by who we obey. You have to be careful what people tell you to put on. And you have to attire yourself with things that God say. Put on. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Put on. The whole armor of God in Ephesians 6. Put on the garment of praise. Put on the doctrine of God. We want to put on everything except what is given by God spiritually to protect you. What is beneficial by God to give you wisdom and knowledge. What is necessary from God to protect you. We want to obey everything and everyone but God. And we have to be careful Because of the warfare that will so easily beset many. And so God reminds us the necessity of obeying God. That's why we have to rebuke some people. That's why Jesus had to rebuke Peter. Peter was making a statement to Jesus that was out of the will of God. And when anyone tries to have you to do something that's out of the will of God, you have to rebuke it. Our colors, whether we drive it, wear it, live in a room, have it on a carpet, have it on our shoes, our hands, our hair, whatever people are into. We're not of the world. So we don't put our faith in colors. Colors are nice. They represent differences. But God never tells us to put our faith and trust in. And so we have to be wise with our holy calling to not be led down paths of unrighteousness and find ourselves in the adversary's hands because God upholds all things by the power of his word. And his word is invisible. The orchestrating of it, we can see the impact, the manifestation, the necessity of the application in our life. But the word is not a color. The word is his power, a living word. The word is his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding. 
The word is his mind, his heart, his counsel. Tells us to abide in his word, to put on the garment of praise, Isaiah 61 3, to put on the doctrine of God, Titus 2 10, to put on the bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering, Colossians 3 12. He's and to put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6. He's telling us. But it's necessary that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the adversary. Now, we can take humanity's wisdom and dishonor God, or we can take God's wisdom and withstand the wiles of the devil. And kindness has nothing to do with how many perceive it, it is Christ-like virtues. Now, why would you take advice from anyone who wants you to operate in ways that are not Christ-like virtues to make you think you're more than what you are? That's why the Bible says, humble yourself in the presence of the holy and righteous God and do not think yourself more than what you are to examine yourself in the faith. And we ought to judge. We ought to judge actions. We ought to judge works. We ought to judge Christ-like virtues. That's a representation of an outward manifestation of what you're doing. It's either in alignment with God or it's not. And we should know the difference between what is acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God and what is not. And we don't become what is not becoming of Christ. Put on the humbleness of mind, humility. Put on meekness. That's self-control and inner control. It's not weakness. It's a strength. But the world sees meekness as a weakness. That's the paradox of what we put on as Christian followers of Christ, as God's wisdom that are spiritual that has greater manifestation than anything humanity can create or purchase. Now, I love clothes. I love adorning myself with jewelry and clothes. I've been like that all my life. I love modeling my homes and having nice furniture and, 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 and drapery and, and, and everything organized. I love driving my vehicle that's very well organized and everything is just working properly. But none of those things can protect me. They don't have power in them. The power is in the excellency of who God is. Those things will fail me if I put my faith and trust in them. My faith and trust has to be in the power of God. And in order to access the power of God, I have to obey God. I have to be in Christ, but not of the world. I have to abide in his covenant, in his love, in his bowels of mercy, his humbleness of mind, his meekness. I have to have the whole armor applied in my life. I have to have the garment of praise that gives me my inner strength and acknowledges who my God is. I have to abide in the doctrine of God. 
It's not about your environment. Environment can be controlled by external influences. Environment can be changed and controlled by humanity. Environment can be set up and designed to appear what it is not. We should be stronger than our environment. That's why the adversary should not be able to come in and do some destruction. Because we are to be abiding in the truth of God and the adversary should not feel comfortable. It should be fleeing. If we are obeying God, the adversary should be fleeing. It can come and try to hang out with you, but there'll be no agreement. It can come and try to influence you, but there'll be no following. It can come and try to deceive you, but it will not be victorious. It can come and try to change you, but there will be no transformation. Only through Christ Jesus. Because the outside influences is conformity. And we don't conform, we're renewed through our mind. The mind that's in Christ. That's why I can't partake of everybody's advice. Some advice you have to let people know. Your advice, I cannot receive. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from God. You don't have to explain it to them. You don't have to try to get them to understand. That's for them to go to God to understand. But you can't tell them. Where did you get it from? Did it come from God? Because God has not confirmed that. That is your doing. And then tell them to go back. Before you had something else. Now you're making it about this. And that. And this. And that. That is not of God. God is unchanging. He's unwavering. He's steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the working of his way. And God will never, never have anyone to speak into your life that he doesn't confirm. That's why Adam and Eve was never to listen to Satan. Because God spoke into Adam's and Eve's life and told them no. When Adam and Eve communicated with Satan, they should have immediately known. That's not what God told us. That's what you're saying. But God said no. God did not confirm what Satan said to Adam and Eve. And so we cannot accept what everybody says. They may mean well, but meaning well is still disobedient. So sometimes you're going to have to ask these people, do you have on the whole arm of God? Because if you do, you wouldn't be saying that to me. Something that was said over 35 years ago. That you don't made it about 20, 30 people. Five and six different places. 20 different things. There's no consistency, which is a implementation of deception. And God will always show you deception. That's why this Bible says we're not led by emotions. We're led by the spirit of God. We're not led by opinions. We're led by the knowledge of God. We're not led by self. We're led by the will of God. And we have to be careful. That's what long suffering is. When someone wants you to take their ideology, 
when someone wants you to take their ways over God's ways, we cannot, we must reject it. And put on the whole arm of God and put on the doctrine of God and put on the garment of praise and put on bowels of mercy, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering and kindness. We can say it in a very nice way. That may be for you, but God is not confirmed that. And I cannot receive what God has not authorized for me to receive in my life. My faith is not in the wisdom of humanity, but it's in the wisdom of God. There comes a time when you must know your God for yourself. We live in times that if you don't know God, you will be deceived. We live in periods that if you don't trust in God, you will be led down roads of prediction and destruction. We live in times that it is critical that we trust the God of creation and obey God because it is so necessary so critical to obey God. It's not about what you see. The power doesn't come from what you see. The power comes from obeying God. The power comes from allowing God to manifest his wisdom in our lives. There's so much. Put on the new person that's been created in righteousness and holiness. Put on the arm of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 4.24, Ephesians 6.11, Ephesians 6.14. Put on the new person renewed in knowledge and in the image of God who created you, Colossians 3.10. Put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering, Colossians 3.12. Put on the armor of light, Romans 13.12. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 13, 40. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet and hope of your salvation, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. Put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. Put on the clothing of righteousness and salvation through Christ Jesus, Isaiah 61 10. Put on humility, 1 Peter 5 5. God gave us so many examples of what to put on. And we cannot let our fleshly desires and understanding focus on what has no power that cannot sustain is unsustainable towards Christ virtues Christ like virtues that's our identity these qualities compassion kindness humility meekness and patience they are essential 
for maintaining unity and love within the body of Christ. They reflect God's character and enable believers to live in harmony with one another. Not about what we see. It's not about who see me. It's not about what I see. It's about God sees all things and he is instructing you in wisdom. And what we see is what God shows. And we are blessed when we see the wisdom of God being personified because we obey God. When others try to influence you away from God and you follow the wisdom of God and you see the power of God that's protecting you, that's feeding you with his integrity of his heart and skillfully navigating you through the trials and tribulations of life. Joy is not about what you want. Peace is not about what you can do. These are attributes that come from God. It's not about your environment. Daniel was at peace, but his environment was inconducive. King Nebuchadnezzar was trying to stop everything about his character in Christ, in God. But he had peace because he had a relationship with God that propelled him, compelled him to take a stand against unrighteousness. You can't be in agreement with everybody. It doesn't work. That's why that pastor could not be in agreement with the guest pastor. He began to use profanity. He began to absurd, ungodly, Christ-like virtues in front of everybody in the congregation and cursed the pastor out. One clergy to another clergy. We don't conduct ourselves that way. That did not edify Christ. That was not even of the spirit of Christ. For if he was concerned about the souls, he would have not conducted himself that way. He would have not made it about his working. It would have been Christ's working. And Christ can continue the work even when you're not there. You're just an instrument. But God does the work with you or without you. He doesn't need humanity. He can just pour it all in. Humanity's on his own. Because he knows humanity. They will try to become like God. That's why we don't focus in the conformity of the world. I don't need to see you. If I need to see you to receive anything that God never said I need to see you to receive, that's folly. That's putting my faith and trust in humanity. And I can't do that. My life is too important. My life has been redeemed by God, divinity. And I will never put humanity over divinity. I can't. That's adultery. That's high altars that are unwise. Tear down those high altars tear down worldliness tear down opinions tear down human desires because anybody who speaks more of what they want in your life 
that is not saying the will of God, you need to disassociate yourself with. You see, as you fast and pray and seek God, he shines light where there's darkness to keep you on the narrow path when you stray from the path. We all begin to listen to others, but God will yoke you back to his perfect will for your life. And soon show you and bring to your remembrance when he called you, not one of them was around you. When he called you, no one was there. When he called you, they didn't even know your calling. When he called you, he gave you some information because he knew years later it would try to be changed and it couldn't. You cannot take someone back to paths that God is not drawing them back because humanity wants to travel a road for their personal gain and objective. I'm sure when Abraham began to increase in the covenantal blessing that God gave him, his parents wanted, them to come, wanted him to come back. Abraham could not because he has to obey God over humanity. You see, the blessing is in obedience to God. Never humanity. It's always in the blessing and obedience of God. Because humanity will change on you. That's why one day they'll try to bless you and the next day they'll try to curse you. One day King Nebuchadnezzar trying to bless Daniel. The next day he trying to curse Daniel. That's humanity. It's always about a specific human desire. But God's blessing is not about a specific human desire. It's about foreknowledge that he knows what you will do and what you won't do. He knows what you will accept and what you will not accept. He knows how far you will go and how far you will not go. He knows just how much you will obey him, pray, seek him, and how much you will not. You can't do anything to surprise God. And so for people to think that they can control you by removing what you have, if you never put your faith and trust in the things you had, you will soon see you can still accomplish everything without what you had anyway. Because whatever God has for you to do, he will equip you. He will never have you to do something. He's not going to give you something to do it with. And if he allows anything to be removed, it's so that you will never be dependent on that. You see, I was always used to living by myself when I bought my first home by myself. And so I was used to quiet. I was used to organization. I was used to everything being in place and being able to access it when I'm ready to access it. I can control who comes and goes. I can control when I'm on the phone. I can control the noise. I can control my household with God. And it took some time leaving one environment to another environment that was a culture shock. I didn't have the organization. I didn't have the, the, I didn't have the control. And God had to show me that's insignificant. And you learn how to push through it. And as you push through it, everything that you first had to come up against gets behind you, Satan. 
because you pushed through it. It's now behind you. It's no longer a hindrance. It's no longer a stronghold, an entanglement. It's no longer a device that humanities the counsel of the Lord comes in and standeth forever. You learn how to push through. That's why I can do all these sermons. I can do this in my home, in the quiet of my office while I'm working, studying. It wasn't about going out to preach anyway. That's humanity's desires and wants. God had me focusing on something else as I prepared my material. I always stay in-house at a place anyway. I never really go out. It wasn't about that. That's others' opinions and desires. And so I continued to do the discipline that God had placed within me. That's why it didn't hinder me. I had to learn to push through it, put it behind me. When you push through, you put it behind you. Get thee behind me, Satan. You put it behind you. And I had many obstacles because everybody wanted it to be what they wanted it to be to benefit them. It was never about God's will. And so God had to push it behind. What am I saying? Sometimes you got to let God work it out. Because you can't control how people take words and get wrong meaning. Jesus went through the same thing. He spoke, they misunderstood. Because they had already devised in their heart what they wanted it to mean. And until God changes the mind and the heart, there have no agreement and unity. And so you have to push through and put it behind you. Many things are behind me. I'm not looking back. It's behind me. I don't have time to look back. I have to put those things behind me and continue forward. So it's no longer a hindrance. When I go to look for things I had and I don't have, it doesn't hinder me. It doesn't upset me. I just go to God and he deposits it within me. He takes me another way to show me many different diversifications of what he could do. That he has unlimited resources and no one can stop his purpose and plan for my life. I can't talk about your life. I don't know your purpose. I know that all purposes for creation is to have Christ-like virtues. But I don't know your specific purpose. So I can determine whether or not you have Christ-like purposes by whether or not you try to put your purpose on my life. That God isn't confirming. That's what you say. Where did you get it from? Because if God said it, he's going to confirm it. You will be a confirmation, not a stumbling block. You see, 
The adversary was a stumbling block to Adam and Eve, not a confirmation. He was against the will and knowledge of God that God had already told Adam and Eve. That's why we have to be so careful because it can be so subtle. It doesn't have to be intentional deception. When Eve gave Adam, from that tree, there was an intentional deception. She was sharing what she had, but it was wrong because she was told not to. Everything is not intentional. It could be a desire to care, to share, but it's wrong. It could be you think it's the right way to go, but it was wrong. You wanted to accept that. And because you want to accept that, then accept it. But you cannot force what you accept on me because we're all held accountable unto God individually. That's why it's so necessary to trust God. That's what gives you peace and joy. This is not about me sitting behind a, t behind a computer. I sit in a pulpit on television. Never took a day off. Sit at many churches in pulpit and never took a day off. That's why it's important to follow God's path and not somebody's path because they want a career and they have selfish motives to accomplish what they desire that has nothing to do with my individual purpose. That's why it's necessary. I can't get into what you do. I don't know what you're doing. That's between you and God. I don't get in. And we have to be careful about getting into others' actions. I don't get in. You cannot listen to everybody that tells you You better ask them individually and ask God and get a connection. And many should know that. How many people come and say, so-and-so said it was okay. And you go ask the person and the person say, I never authorized that. But yet you thought it was authorized and you acted upon it. Because you wanted it to be that way. That's why I don't get into people's personal things. You have to answer yourself to God. I cannot. If that's what God is telling you, that's for you. I have to be obedient to God. And that's why it's so necessary to obey God. We see in scripture the necessity of every individual one obeying God.
Let's get ready to go to the throne of grace. Sustainable in Christ's kindness. We should be sustainable in Christ like virtues through the Holy Spirit. We can't do this in the flesh. Anything we do for Christ, anything, prayer, just speaking to one another about the things of God and our uprising and our downsetting, just living for Christ. Should be in the excellency of who he is. It's not about living for people. We are to live for Christ because he sees everything we do and he knows everything that forms in our mind and in our heart and our will. God is omniscient. He's omnipotent and he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So there's nowhere that I should not experience the power of God within me and not desire to obey God. And you can't worry about what people say. Sometimes they should keep their mouth closed. They don't have Christ-like virtues. And they speak to intimidate with no truth. I'm not doing this for people. Where did you get that from? God did not give me that responsibility. I did not make an agreement with people or anyone who can stand before God and say it was agreed that that's what I'm doing. So you have to be careful about falling into deception of disillusion of other people's agendas. Which is why I see why God had me doing this here. Minding my own business with God. I don't need your permission to do what I'm doing. I don't need your validation, your authorization. We have to be careful when there was no agreement. And you just accept someone's statement that was never in alignment with the truth. You better know the person's character. To know the truth. Because you're going to all be held accountable by God for your actions and what you continue to perpetrate that God knows he's not authorized. Sustainable and Christ-like virtues. Sustainable and Christ's kindness. Fit not in a sickness that's just an acronym to remember sustainable and Christ's kindness 
like Spar, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were Greek philosophers. That's the order in which they came. So don't think of sick as sickness. Think of it as being sustainable in Christ's kindness, his virtues. Let's put our mind back in perspective of what God is doing and not what people wanted for their career path that had nothing to do with me. That's not my career. See, we have to be careful how people will select things that they feel will benefit them for their career path and make it about what they feel it will benefit them. We saw that with the disciples. We saw that with some of the Pharisees. Jesus had to endure that with the multitude. And so we have to deal with it by allowing it to be placed back in God's hands and we stay faithful to what God is telling you to do. That's why it's always a blessing when you obey God. Because the blessing that you receive is inward. That God keeps pouring into you. Because if you're faithful over a few things, he makes you rule over many things. Much information, much confirmation, much practical application and foresight on how the adversary can come in and breed deception. And it's so subtle that people won't even know it. They think they're right in their own sight. And you can't tell them nothing. Jesus tried to tell them they didn't, they wouldn't receive it because they were not seeking the Father. They were seeking their own will. And until you seek him, some things God will never tell you. So when I wanted to know, I saw them in eyes. And he told me, that's not something to be concerned about. Don't even worry about that. I didn't tell you and I didn't confirm. That's a pass. That someone thought they could recreate. And you cannot be God and try to recreate anything. to try to acquire knowledge. That's impossible because God has to reveal it and turn back the hands of time. There will never be another yesterday, November the 10th, 2024. So it's impossible because you're not God to be able to turn back the hands of time. That's why people have to be careful what they become connected to that wastes your time. Time is a valuable commodity. And Satan is a time waster. And by the time most people figure out they're wasting their time with Satan. And that they'll never get that time back. They're usually too far gone. Because they won't take the time to go through the throne of grace. something that's made available for you that God will show you and give you the wisdom.
We're in Christ. We're in his covenants. We're in his love. But he requires that we put on what he has made available spiritually. The garment of praise. The doctrine of God. The whole armor. Bowels of mercy, meekness, humility. And much more that I spoke about earlier. That God is reminding. Now, let me give you a little background as I close out. When Paul wrote Colossian, he was in prison. So you see, while he was incarcerated, contained in walls, he was not conformed. His mind was renewed by the spirit of Christ. So he was able to continue to speak the spiritual knowledge and wisdom that God had given him. Your environment does not stop. God from communicating with you. Your environment does not stop God from working out a situation. God can get anything to you no matter where you're at. It's how you go after seeking God. You can sit back and murmur and complain, or you can go to the throne of grace and be able to obtain all that you have need of and receive it from God. Now, the Bible says that Colossi was facing many challenges from false teaching. There was a mixture of Jewish legalism and Gnostic philosophy. And these teachings were threatening to divert the believers from the centrality of Christ. They were adding Christ plus, Christ plus this, Christ plus that. But it's Christ and Christ alone that gives us the virtues of his likeness being made into his image, through his spirit. So Paul emphasized Christ's supremacy and his sufficiency. And we don't see Christ as being supreme, nor do we see him as his sufficiency. We want to add to him. Christ plus this. Christ plus that. Christ plus a little of this. Christ plus a little of that. But not Christ supremely and sufficiently. So Paul urges believers to live according to their new identity in him. Our identity is in Christ, not Christ plus humanity's likes and dislikes, not Christ plus humanity's opinions nor their will. Our identity has been established in Christ. So Colossians 3 focuses on practical instructions for Christian living. Contrasting the old life, which was marked by disobedience, rebellion, lack of knowledge and wisdom and understanding with the new life in Christ. So then verses 12 through 17 outline the virtues in, in Colossians 1 that characterizes this new life. It reflects the believer's transformation through Christ. We are transformed through Christ. Now, I know some people want to make this a uh, worldly transformation. You know, we, 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 we transform our life. We lose weight and, and we get a new hairdo and we get a new color scheme that matches our complexion and, and we look a different way. And that's all well and fine. That's the outer appearance of the body. But never make the outer appearance much more important than the inner transformation that only God can do. And it's the inner that overflows to the outer. 
And the problem with the Pharisees is that their outer was an array with such form of godliness, but their inner was dying because it lacked the relationship with God. They had a form of godliness, but they had not the intimacy with God to even know the things of God that they could have received. They didn't put on the garment of praise. They didn't put on the doctrine of God. They didn't put on meekness, mercy, humility, long-suffering, self-control. They didn't put on in Christ. They didn't put on the armor of God. They put on their outer garments that had no power, that had no symbolism other than an outer appearance of what they were to be. Lacking inner relationship and intimacy with a holy and righteous God. That's why we have to focus on our relationship first and foremost. Because nothing we put on the outer is going to give you the power. Because the power within these earthly vessels is the excellency of God. And if you have the excellency of God within you, it's going to be reflected outwardly. And it will show what is made about during trials and tribulations. You won't be able to stop. No matter what humanity does, no matter what ungodly principalities and powers do. You might hinder temporarily, but you'll never stop it. Impossible. You, we saw how it was delayed for the angel to get to pass, but it came. So we do know delay can happen, but you cannot stop the will of God. And so, in Colossians, it called believers to actively adopt values and virtues to align with your identity in Christ. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. God's character. We are to reflect God's character. We are to reflect God's character. I don't know uh, a, a lot of things that people are into. I, I try not to indulge in it. Um, I, I'm just not. I'm not one that tries to be popular. I'm not one that tries to be famous. I'm not one that tries to be seen. I'm not one that tries to be an attention getter. I, I focus on God seeing, God declaring. God making known, God establishing what he's pleased with according to what I do and what I say. I'm more concerned about honoring God above all. And the reason being is because God has always been faithful. He changes not. That's why I haven't changed what I normally do. I'm at another location. I haven't changed anything I do. Some things change because what has been done to me, but I didn't make change. And so God navigated it through because it wasn't his will. And when things are done to you that is not God's will, he fights your battle and navigates through it and puts it behind you. 
and you rise above it. It's not a concern. It's, that's in God's hands. It just was fruitless. It was wasteful. It was unproductive. It was not approved nor authorized by God, but allowed so that God could show himself mighty, that he's the wiser and more knowledgeable one, and that he's going to get his will no matter what. And so you depend on God. My God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I'm sustained in Christ's kindness and Christ's virtues. I'm kept by the power of God. I belong to God. His vessel, my vessel belongs to him. My desire is to be pleasing and acceptable in his sight. Because he has proven himself manifested his power, revealed his knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and has given me the ability to push through. And so I don't focus on a lot of things. I can't become engaged in a lot of things because it's folly. And the adversary can take some things and linger it on for 40 years like they did in the wilderness, 70 years when they went in captivity. And you have to know the workings of God. And I have not changed anything I've said that I said I would do, that God told me I shall do. He just didn't say how. But he said I shall. Like he told Abraham, he shall. Like he told Sarah, he shall. Like he told Hezekiah, he shall. Like he told Jeremiah, he shall. Like he told Isaiah, he shall. Like he told Ezekiel, I shall. Like he told Daniel and Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, he shall. Like he told Paul, John, Matthew, he shall. Like he told Isaac and Jacob, he shall. Like he told Joshua, Deborah, Ruth, Samuel, he shall. Because whatever God says, it shall come to pass. So I abide in what God says. Not humanity. I may question what humanity said and ask God to give me understanding of why it said. And then give you the reason why I will not submit to it. Because some things are established for different purposes than God. 
And so I just don't subject myself to it. I move through it, push through it, put it behind me. And speak about the character of God. What he tells us we are required to put on. Show it to me in scripture. He'll uphold it. Give it to me in your opinion. And what? He's not upholding it. It would have to be upheld by humanity. So if you want to go back and talk about the past, a journey, then you can show that revelation. But you cannot make that substantiate. That's the past. And you can't make the past the future. Hmm. So we see what God has brought to manifestation. May the power of God, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God rule and rest in your life that you may feel the need to be drawn by God to question and ask God to validate anything that is said to you to make sure it is in alignment with his will because God will always validate so that you will stay in his will because there's a blessing in staying in God's will. If Adam and Eve would have stayed in God's will, they would have remained blessed in that God. But they didn't trust God. Trust is not about whether you understand everything or not. Trust is trusting God at his word. He said, don't, you don't. Whether you understand why. He said, don't. He didn't even have to tell them why, but he told them why, but they didn't understand. But they believed what God had told them not to do. They believe that it would be okay. That's why you cannot listen to someone telling you everything is okay when they're promoting things out of the will of God, out of the wisdom of God, out of the knowledge of God. Look at how many people change God's doctrine and trying to change it back. Because when they changed it, they didn't foresee all the ramifications and consequences that would occur. And now they're trying to bring it back. There are consequences for that. God is not going to do that. God doesn't change. He's consistent. Humanity will to adapt to their understanding. And quite often, whenever you change something that God has put in place as a protection mechanism, as a wisdom mechanism, you'll have to go back to its original intention. Once you change it, you'll see. It was deception. And you have to return back to its original intention. And that's why many should learn today. Don't ever accept a change in God's will. If he said it, that's what he meant. If he established it, that's what he's desired.
And we can't box God, just like we can't put him in a room with the door. That's folly. We can't box him into our ideology. God is God. That's what faith and trust is. Acknowledging that he is the wiser and seeking him to give you understanding. And all you're getting, get understanding. The gifts has nothing to do with the location. You could be in the same place and operate in a multiplicity of gifts. You could be in the same place and have Christ-like virtues. That doesn't change. And we have limitation in our mind that they, we can set it and orchestrate it at different locations. And God doesn't operate that way. He's omnipresent. He determines what, how he flows through humanity. He determines how humanity receives understanding. He determines the truth and executes the truth. That makes us sustainable in Christ-like virtues. We can be sustainable in Christ-like virtues if we desire to be maintained in Christ-like virtues. Because we're kept by him, not by our human strength, not by people. God don't have people based on worldly standards. He has people based on his standards. And we have to be careful how that can quite often be defined. His kingdom is the wiser towards life. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for the impartation of this message from above that gives all the knowledge to trust God beyond understanding. Peter didn't understand, but he had to trust God. Paul didn't understand, but he had to trust God. Abraham didn't understand, but he had to trust God. Mary and Joseph didn't understand. John the Baptist didn't understand. Martha didn't understand. Mary didn't understand. Lazarus didn't understand. Many didn't understand. Naomi didn't understand. But they all had to trust God to receive understanding. And so, Father, we pray that you will implement understanding that you will move over your people's lives and have them to seek you for understanding and not just accept everything that's being said and done. But to trust you and leave some things behind and press forward. Father, we thank you because you've given example where those had to press forward and leave some things behind. There's a time and place for everything. And we should be at a place where we can allow God to do the shifting, the purging, and to bring in forth clarification and understanding. 
that we remain rooted and grounded in who you are as we depend upon you to give a revelation towards understanding. So, Father, we thank you because of who you are. We thank you, Father, because we desire to receive from you. And when we desire to receive from you, we're never disappointed. We could just look at actions and see they're not in alignment with you. Wishy-washy. Changing, shifting. Over opinions. Over wants. But never once about your will. And so, Father, we thank you for your will that changes not. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. If you seek God's will, you'll never be disappointed because he will always fulfill his will. And how well did many of the prophets learn that even when he fulfilled his will and they became a little disappointed because they wanted it to be their will, they learned to accept his will, the greatest will of all. Amen, amen, amen.